Okay, good morning. Um, so there are two things that I aim to actually talk about today. The first thing is something that I actually hope to cover in the first lecture but didn't quite had to. It shouldn't take all that long but we need it a bit later so I might as well talk about it now and, and that's the subject of the operator product expansion which is a property of any quantum field theory. And then I'll spend most of the lecture talking about the Gaussian model as an example of a conformal field theory in two dimensions. So you remember, so let me first of all start talking about the operator product expansion which is universally known by the acronym OPE. So um, you, you remember that uh, in the last lecture we defined the scaling limit of the correlation functions that phi i of r1, sorry, I'll write later. phi i of r1, phi j of r2, dot, 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 dot. These can be any number of other scaling fields. Was defined as the limit as the lattice spacing goes to zero of the renormalized lattice observable correlation function. So a to the minus xi, minus xj, minus dot, dot, dot. Sometimes the same thing on the lattice, phi i lattice r1, phi j lattice r2, dot, 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 on the lattice. Okay. So this scaling limit, however, is not a uniform limit. That is, it doesn't work for all values of, of r i and r2. R1 and R2, and, and so forth. In fact, it only works if the points are not coincident. So, so it only works if R1 is not equal to R2, is not equal to R3, if they're all distinct points. So that means that in units of the lattice spacing, they're actually a long way apart from each other, because but we are keeping the distances fixed and letting the lattice spacing approach zero. Um, um, so, however, the way that the renormalized correlation functions behave as the points do approach each other is, in fact, given by this operator operator product expansion and it's good just to think of this in terms of a picture if the point r1 is here the point r2 is here we've got phi i here phi j here and and then the dot dot dots here mean other scaling fields at other points and let's assume for the time being, that these other points are are a long way away. That is, this distance is large compared to the distance between R1 and R2. So, from the point of view of the of the fields over here we're not really going to be able to distinguish between whether this is a product of two local fields or whether it itself is a local field. So the idea is that you can write this product as some linear combination of local fields evaluated, for example, at the midpoint between R1 and R2. 
So another way of understanding this is to go back to the lattice and to say, well, these lattice observables I told you were linear combinations of products of local spins, for example. So if the points R1 and R2 are coinciding on the lattice, then any linear combination of products of spins here multiplied by a linear combination of products of spins here can obviously itself be written as a linear combination of products of spins. Okay, so this obviously works on, on the lattice and the OPE is going to be the continuum version. So the way it works is that we is that we is that we look at this correlation function here. Phi i of r one phi j of r two dot dot dot, and we write it as a sum over k times a coefficient which are called c i j k which is going to depend upon the distance between R1 and R2 times the correlation function of phi k evaluated at the midpoint dot, 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 where the dot, 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 dot represents all these, the product of all these other operators um, and is the same here as here. So that that is the idea of the OPE, and this is going to be a sum over k, a sum over all the possible scaling operators in the theory, scaling fields in the theory. Okay, and I told you that in general there's an infinite number of these, so this is this is this is some infinite sum. Now, because this is true, so the main thing is that these coefficients here, C, I, J, Ks, are independent of which operators we choose to have here and here. That's the important thing. Okay. Because what's going on here is local, and it's independent of what's going on here. So we actually write this equation in a more formal way, that is we remove the expectation value and we say this is equal to this. So that's the form of the OPE that you'll actually see in, in, in the books. And it's true in a sort of operator sense. That is, it's true if we multiply it by any operator or scaling field that we want and, and take the expectation value. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. Okay, so, so the argument was that if I look at the correlation function of the product of these two fields with, with any other group of, of <laughs> fields here, and they're a long way away, then from the, so they're on the other side of this room here, and from that point of, of, of view, I can't distinguish between the products of these two operators and a linear combination of other, uh, other operators. Okay, so this is a result which is true in any any quantum field theory and within perturbation theory you can prove that it's true order by order or you can regard it as an axiom of a conformal field theory and in fact there's an axiomatic way of developing conformal field theory in which the OPE is basically one of the assumptions or axioms, but it does have this physical um, justification, which is what I've just tried to, 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 to make. Okay?
Okay, so for example, if this was an Ising spin and an Ising spin, then from far away they look, look like an energy density. So if this was an Ising spin and Ising spin, the things that we the leading term on the right hand side would be the energy density, which is the product of two Ising spins. Yep. Sorry? Well, if we have rotational, so if these are scalars, okay, if, if these are scalars, this is going to be a function of the distance here. But they don't have to be scalars, in which case it wouldn't be. Okay. Yeah. But I'm going to assume, just to make the notation simple, that they are scalars. Okay. Now, this is actually true in any quantum field theory, whether it's massive or, or not. But if we're in a conformal field theory, that is, if we have, if we have scale invariance, then we can imagine making a, a scale transformation. R1 goes to B R1. R2 goes to B R2. And we know how these fields transform, and we know how this one does, because it transforms according to its scaling to scaling to I mentioned, roughly speaking, phi i of b r is b to the minus x i phi i of r. So that tells us that in a scale invariant theory, that c i j k of r i of r one minus r two has to go like r one minus r two to the x i plus x j minus x k. Just, just, just using this and making this justification here. Uh, apart from a constant here, and this constant I'm going to call c tilde i j k. Okay. So that's the form of the OPE of two scalar operators in a conformal field theory. Now, you remember I looked at the three-point function of phi a, phi i of r1, phi j of r2, phi k of r3. I talked about that last time. I said conformal invariance fixes this to have a certain form which I'm not going to write down again, it's a bit complicated, with a coefficient here which I called Cijk. And you can take this form and you can assume that, that R1 minus R2 is much, much less than R1 minus R3, and R, R2 minus R3, that is, these two points, R1 and R2, are much closer than their distance from R3. Okay, and then you can apply the OPE to this. Okay, so this thing is, I'm not going to write all the R dependence here, but it's basically a sum over K times C tilde i j k, it's the sum over k prime times phi of k prime. Okay, not putting in all the r dependence. So this, this, this thing is this. So I can take the correlation function of this with phi k with phi k. And I told you that 
two different fields with with different labels are orthogonal. This is a sum of two point functions. So what we have done by using the OPE in the three point function is to write it as a sum of two point functions here. But these two point functions are orthogonal, therefore this is proportional to C i j k. Okay. And I haven't written all the R dependence there, how it works out. These are quantum fields. Yeah, yeah. Always I'm talking about a quantum field theory here, not a classical field theory. Okay, so we can compare the results of, of this calculation with the explicit form here in the same limit. And we then come to, come to the conclusion, sorry, this was C tilde, that C tilde is the same as C. Okay, so the coefficients that appear in the three-point function here are precisely the OPE coefficients. That also tells you, if you look at the form of the three-point function, it tells you, because I can permute these, 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 these fields, I can move them around, it tells us that the CIJKs are in fact symmetric in the indices, totally symmetric in the IJKs. Therefore, so are the OPE coefficients. So if I look at the coefficient of phi k in the product of phi i and phi j, then it's the same as the coefficient, for example, of phi j in the product of phi i and phi k. These are also totally symmetric in the indices, though it's not obvious that they were from the way that I defined them originally. But that's a consequence of conformal symmetry. Any questions? So, it turns out that once we know all the scaling dimensions, the whole set of scaling dimensions, or and we know the spins as well of all the, 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 the fields, and once we know all the CIJKs, then that's enough data to give all the correlation functions. And just as an example, let me look at a four-point function, phi i, phi j, phi uh, l, phi m, for example. And I won't put in the points, but I'll just indicate where they are here. So here's phi i, phi j, phi l, and phi m uh, at these points in in the end of the half plane. And one thing that I didn't tell you, which I should have done, was that I justified this OPE by, by saying that these other fields had to be a very long, long way away from, from these. That is, the ratio of this distance to this distance had to be small. But what you can actually show is that this OPE has a finite radius of convergence. Okay, so it actually works when the ratio, uh, when this ratio is of order one even. So in, this, in the situation which I have drawn here, this distance here is perhaps slightly smaller than the, the, the best distance here, but it doesn't have to be for, for me to apply the OPE. So I can apply the OPE to this four-point function by, by drawing a diagram that looks like this. 
And that basically means that I have written this as a sum over k. This is phi k, which is propagating in the middle here. So, so, so I've used the OPE of phi i and phi j to get phi k here. And that's going to have an OPE coefficient c i j k. And here I have used the OPE of phi l and 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 phi m to to get a k prime a phi k prime say, but then I take the two point function here that tells me that k has to equal k, k prime, so it's the same k here. So here I get a coefficient c l m k. So roughly roughly taking and. Uh, 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 of course, the algebra is actually much more complicated. I can write this four-point function as a sum over k of all the a link fields, and each one comes in with a coefficient c i j k times c l m k. Okay, so once I know the scaling dimensions and the CIJKs, I can compute, for example, the, the four-point function. And I can compute the five-point function and the six-point function, etc. All the end-point functions. Now, one thing that, that should have occurred to you immediately is that there are different ways I could have actually drawn this. I could have also drawn it by taking the OPE of phi i and phi l and doing some sum over k prime here and with phi j and phi m. Okay? And these two things have to be equal. But this is a highly non trivial constraint. It's a constraint on the set of scaling dimensions, and also a quadratic constraint on the OPE coefficients. So this set of constraints, if you write it down for all possible external fields here, is called the conformal bootstrap. And in recent years, there's been a huge amount of progress in actually implementing this, okay? So if you make some minimal assumptions about what the, the spectrum of, of, of scaling to high dimensions is, and you exploit conformal invariance as much as you possibly can, then you can get constraints on these and also determine what the OPE coefficients are. So this has been done now, for example, in three dimensions for the, for the conformal field theory, which represents the critical point of the three-dimensional icing model. Okay. And it gives us the best possible estimates for the critical exponents of the three-dimensional Icing model. Not only does it give us estimates, but it gives us rigorous bounds on them. So this this whole method, which unfortunately would take me another week of lectures to actually explain, because it gets extremely technical, is the is a very interesting new development in conformal field theory. That's only just, although it was initially suggested a long time ago uh, has only been recently been implemented largely because at some point you get into a massive linear programming problem and um, and the computer power just wasn't available originally so are there any questions about that I'd be happy to explain it a little bit more, 
maybe in the tutorial or informally, but it's not the direction that I want to go in these lectures. Once I know the two-point functions and the three-point functions, then I know the end-point functions. Yeah, from these two. Well, that's still an infinite amount of information. But <clears throat> OK. So now I'm going to uh, change paces, and I'm going to look at a particular model, the Gaussian model, which is an, a nice example of a two-dimensional CFT. So this actually starts with something that was mentioned yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is the which is the two-dimensional XY model. So in the two-dimensional XY model, you ha you have a lattice, and we have lattice lattice sites are as as before and at each site we have a two-dimensional vector of unit length which we can write as cosine theta of r sine theta of r okay so at each site of this lattice we have a rotor or something can point in an arbitrary direction in the plane that's why it's called the XY model. And the energy or the Hamiltonian of this model is minus j sum over nearest neighbors now, r and r prime, times s of r dot s of r prime, which we can write as minus j sum over r and r prime cosine of theta r minus theta r prime. OK. So, so that's the Hamiltonian. And what, for example, we would like to do is to work out the partition function, which is the trace, which means that we integrate over all these angles of e to the minus h over kt, which is j over kt sum over r and r prime cosine of theta r minus theta r prime. OK, now what we're interested in doing here is understanding what happens at low temperatures. That is, what happens when j is much bigger than k k k k k k at. You notice that at zero temperature, we're going to try to make the cosine equal to one, so all the angles are going to be equal. It's going to try to order. It turns out that it doesn't order, but it's going to try to order anyway. Um, so that at low temperatures, we can expand out the cosine. Okay, so one way expand the cosine of theta r minus theta r prime is 1 minus 1 half of, of theta r minus theta r prime squared plus, plus dot dot dot. If we plug this into the partition function and neglect the constant which is not important, and we have the dot dot dot, what we have is minus j over kt sum over r and r prime of theta r minus theta r squared with, with a one half in here. Okay? And you and what you can show is that you can well First of all, we are going to argue that this in the scaling limit corresponds to a conformal field theory. That is, its scale invariant corresponds to a renormalization group fixed point for any value of j over kt. And then you can argue that when we're at low temperatures, then all the dot dot dots are irrelevant in the sense of the renormalization group. 
except there is one thing that we're sort of still going to have to remember somewhere at the back of our minds here somewhere is that in the model that we started from theta was a periodic variable okay so it, so in fact theta lies between zero and two pi so it's periodic but we're going to work for a long time forgetting that fact which we can do at, at low temperatures and then eventually uh, we have to remind ourselves that, that that's actually the case okay so what we can do is just make a Taylor expansion of this this is just a a a, a finite difference on the lattice and and just naively go to the the scaling limit and write this as the trace of e to the minus g over 4 pi the the integral of rad theta squared d2r okay so g is going to be proportional to j over kt but i'm going to introduce th this notation for g uh, uh, g here okay right so where was i i'm not too reading my notes okay so um so th 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 this is the two-dimensional gaussian model and it's it's it, it is gaussian because it's only quadratic in the in the in the field theta which means that we can essentially solve everything about it so one thing is that this is this is scale invariant you can basically see this because there are two derivatives here and the, there are two paths of r here so because theta is an angle it's dimensionless but but if we rescale r by a, by a factor b this gets multiplied by b squared and this gets multiplied by one over b squared so the hamiltonian or the action is scale invariant but it's also conformally invariant and the way that you can see that is to use these complex coordinates that i talked about z and z bar is r1 plus or minus i r2 and you can write this integral of grad theta squared d2r as being proportional to i think there's a factor four here somewhere of d z d theta by dz when whenever i write this this means d by dz okay d by dz bar of theta times dz dz bar so you can check that the measure is like this and that the Laplacian squared can be written here so you can do that just by making this change of, of variables and I suggest that you tr try that as an exercise but now if we make a, a conformal mapping z goes to z prime equals f of z then dz is equal to f prime of is equal to one over f prime z dz bar dz prime and dz bar is one over the complex conjugate dz bar prime that's how the measure changes this is just the jacobian 
but d z by d theta is equal to f prime d z prime by d theta and d z bar theta is equal to f prime z bar d d bar theta. So the t t t the two derivatives here transform in a way which is inverse to the Jacobian. So this term cancels this term, this term cancels this term, and what we see is that this is equal to the integral dz prime theta, dz bar prime theta, dz prime, dz bar prime. So the action or the Hamiltonian is conformally invariant. Any questions there? Okay, so this is going to be an example of a conformal field theory, and it's one of the simplest ones. So we now need to calculate a few properties. We would like to calculate what the scaling dimensions are and, and so forth. So the first thing that we should try to do is to calculate the two-point function theta of r theta of zero, okay? So the, 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 the way that we show this as you would in any field theory is by going to momentum space, you write theta of r is the integral d to k over 2 pi squared. I may not get the factors of 2 pi right here, but my final factors are going to be right. e to the ikr of, of theta tilde of k. So theta tilde k is the Fourier transform of, 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 of theta of r so that when I look at this action here, then what I find is that g over 4 pi grad theta squared goes into g over 4 pi integral d2k over 2 pi squared times uh, times theta k, and this is actually complex, right, because theta is real, so I have to write it in this form here. So the, the important thing is that the action, when we write it in k space, is diagonal. So each, so we're interested in e to the minus this, e to the minus this, so each of these theta tilde k is an independent random variable. Yeah, there's a k squared. There's a very important k squared that comes from the derivative. So, so that, that tells us basically by equipartition that the expectation value of, of, of theta of k squared goes like 1 over k squared is proportional to 1 over k squared. Yes, in fact, if I write theta of k1, theta of k2 star, it's 1 over k squared times a delta function. So there they are statistically independent and their covariance is 1 over k squared. So that means that I can plug this expression into here twice and then get an expression for the correlation function. Theta of r, theta of 0. And now I'm going to get the numbers right. Uh, 
is 2 pi of g integral t2k over 2 pi squared um, e to the i k dot r over k squared. Okay. So this is for any of you who have seen an introductory course on quantum field theory, all we're doing here is working out the propagator for a, a free scalar field. All right, so there's a problem here though, right? So there's a, there's a, there's, there is a, a problem that as k goes to zero, this is a divergent integral. I wouldn't worry too much if it were divergent at large k because large k corresponds to large distances and I started off on a lattice so there's an ultraviolet cutoff, there's a short distance cutoff so, so I don't mind too much that there is a cutoff of order 1 over a here. But I do mind the, the, the fact that this appears to be divergent at small k which corresponds to large to large distances. So I think I'll move back here. So I can get around this by, by calculating something finite, which is I subtract its value at zero. So this is equal to 2, 2 pi over g integral d2k over 2 pi squared times e to the i k dot r minus 1 over k squared. And maybe there's an ultraviolet cutoff of order 1 over a here, but it goes all the way down to 0. And now you see, because I've subtracted the value of this at k equals zero, this is a convergent integral at k equals zero. So that's what we have to do. And now we have to, now what we would like to, to, to know is what is the asymptotic behavior of this when, when r gets much larger than a. Okay, so there's, there's, there's actually a nice little, a nice little trick for, for doing this, which is to understand what is happening now at large k. So at large k, I can ignore this term because it's oscillating. So I get, roughly speaking, integral up to order 1 over a of d2k over 2 pi squared, uh, 1 over k squared. That's not b, is it? No. OK. Um, OK, so we can write this going to polar coordinates as integral from uh, order 1 over a times 2 pi k dk over k squared, and there's a 1 over 2 pi squared here. So what we see is, just ignoring what's going on at small k, at large k, this is actually diverging like, um, like uh, 1 over 2 pi times the logarithm of 1 over a with a minus sign here. And I've forgotten this 2 pi over g here. So as a goes to 0, this behaves like logarithm of 1 over a. But the whole thing that we started with is some function is finite. It's some function of r over a. So that tells us that we know how it behaves at large r too. We just put an r in there. So just to 
to summarize this, what, what, what we find is that as for R much, much bigger than A, this goes like, and once again, let me get the numbers right, it goes like um, 1 over G times the logarithm of R over A plus a constant. Okay, so, so it increases logarithmically with, with distance. This tells us that if we're going to think of this as a conformal field theory, then theta is not actually going to be one of the scaling fields that we talked about because scaling fields have correlation functions that decay as a power law and this one increases log logarithmically. And so, so it turns out that that's the case. Um, the, uh, if you go back to the, if you go back to the XY model, if you consider a correlation function that you might want to, want to compute, which is something like this, this is the expectation value of the cosine of theta of r minus theta, uh, theta of r1 minus theta of r2, okay, which is the real part of the, of e to the i theta of r minus i times theta of r1 minus theta of r2. So it's the real part of e to the i theta of r1 times e to the minus i theta of r2. So this, this tells us that going back to the physics, what we're not, we're not really interested in this correlator anyway. We're interested in correlation functions of exponentials of this theta. Those are going to be the physical observables. So these are the kinds of things that we want to actually compute. So I'm going to be a little bit more general and I'm going to think about computing e to the i q theta of r1, e to the i q, e to the minus i q theta of r2. And this is going to be the kind of physical correlation function that we're interested in. So, once again, going backwards, I can write this as the expectation value of e to the iq theta of r1 minus theta of r2. And so that looks like a hard problem, right? Because I could expand it out and do all kinds of, 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 of things. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a trick here, which is due to the fact that this is a Gaussian ensemble. So if ever you have a Gaussian probability distribution, a Gaussian ensemble, then expectations of exponentials of the Gaussian variable are always simple. So one way to actually see this, though it's not the most systematic way, is to think about starting to expand this out. And we have the expectation value of 1 plus IQ theta of r1 minus theta of r2 minus q squared over 2 theta of r1 minus theta of r2 squared plus dot dot dot. Now th this is the expectation value of theta but that's z zero because you can see in this Ensemble, for example, I can change theta goes to, to minus theta, and so it has to be zero. 
this term is non-zero. In, in fact, it's precisely proportional to what I worked out here. This is just theta of r1 minus theta of r2 So, so this is two. This is theta of r squared plus r one squared plus theta of r two squared minus twice theta of r one theta of r two. So it's precisely minus twice what I. <laughs> I computed here if I replace R by R1 minus R2. Now, if I do the trick of just re, re exponentiating this equals question mark e to the minus q squared over 2 of theta of r1 minus theta of r2 all squared, then, then in principle there are higher order terms here, but what you can show for a Gaussian ensemble is, is that these higher terms, which correspond to higher cumulants of the, of the distribution, are, all vanish. So this is a property of a Gaussian distribution, the, the expectation value of an exponential is the exponential of the variance, basically, of this object. So this was the thing that I said was equal to uh, minus 2. I'm going to get some signs wrong at some point. Sorry? It's just a number, right? <laughs> okay, this thing is 2 over g, the logarithm of r1 minus r2 over a with hopefully a plus sign. Well it, well, it has to be positive because it's the square of something. So whether I got the right sign here, I don't know. Okay. So, so the main thing is that this, this expression here is the exponential of a logarithm. And the exponential of the logarithm is a power. So what, what, what we see is that the correlation function e to the, the iq of theta of r1, e to the minus iq of theta of r2 goes proportional to, goes proportional to 1 over r1 minus r2 to something that I'll call 2xq. And this is going to be the scaling dimension of these fields. So when you work out xq, then you find xq is q squared over 2g. Okay. So these are the, the scaling dimensions of the, of the phase operators. Now let's go back and remind ourselves of what I just erased here, that in fact theta is periodic modulo 2 pi. So these operators are, these, these objects are in fact only single valued if q is an integer. q has to be an integer. 
so um, so we actually have in this model in this xy model at, at low temperature we have a discrete spectrum of possible scaling to scaling dimensions uh, which 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 take they form q squared over 2g but they depend interestingly they depend continuously on g and g was a parameter that i can't scale out of my action which i've erased but uh, i can't just so remember my my action was g over 4 pi integral grad grad theta squared so you you might say that by just making theta goes goes to 1 over the square root of g times theta yes is this working still yeah okay um, the, then i could get rid of this g but i can't do that i can't rescale re theta because it's periodic modulo two, two pi so so g has actually a a physical meaning in the xy model and it's and it's basically proportional to the temperature um, okay so this is one set of scaling dimensions in this in this Gaussian model but there's another set so these are sometimes called electric operators electric fields though it's not the electric field electric scaling fields and there's another type which are called magnetic or vortices so if we think about a vortex in in this model we can it actually has a core and then it has a value of so if i call the the polar angle phi then i can think about a configuration where theta of r is proportional to phi and in fact is equal to m phi so as phi goes from 0 to 2 pi theta goes from 0 to m times 2 pi so m has to be uh, once again an integer so these are examples of vortex configurations and these also exist in the xy model now these also have scaling dimensions and the easiest way to get the scaling dimensions of of of, of these is not to compute the two-point function which we can we can compute what is the energy of a vortex anti-vortex but it's just to compute the energy of a single vortex in a finite system and if we do that we get the energy over kt is is equal to g over 4 pi times the integral of grad theta squared d to r but but the, but the, but the gradient of theta in the phi direction is just one over r so this is g over 4 pi integral 1 over r squared uh, d2r which is 2 pi r dr and we should integrate this from short distances a up to the size of the system l so this goes like uh, g over 2 log l over a so that's its energy and, and and its contribution to the partition function e to the minus e over kt goes like and uh, there's an m squared here which i which i forgot m squared m squared goes like 
A over L, 1 over the distance to what I'll call X tilde of M, where X tilde of M is the scaling dimension of a magnetic operator or, or a vortex, and it's M squared G over 2. Okay, so we, we have two sets of different kinds of, of scaling operators in this, in, in this model. One are, are the exponentials of the field, which we sometimes call electric operators or spin waves sometimes. The others are, are the magnetic operators or, or the vortices. And you see that it's a very similar formula, except we've got 1 over G here and we've got G here. So there's a duality here in this model, and the G goes to 1 over G. The magnetic operators become the electric operators and, and vice versa. The reason that they're called electric and magnetic is that if you look at Maxwell's equations in four dimensions with electric charges and magnetic monopoles, and reduce those down from four dimensions to two dimensions by making things independent of, of the other coordinates, you essentially get this model where the electric charges and magnetic charges become these exponentials of, of the field and the vortices. Well, this is critical all the way. So the, uh, the two-dimensional XY model is unusual in that they're at low temperatures, all temperatures below the critical temperature, you have power law decay of correlations. But the critical exponents themselves depend on the temperature. And um, what happens at the phase transition is that one of these vortex operators becomes relevant and drives you away. Okay, so this is the costalis thalus phase transition for which one of the things for which costalis and thalus just received the Nobel Prize. But I just want to focus here on what's happening at low temperatures, so I'm not going to talk explicitly about the costalist Thales transition. <clears throat> okay, so I want to use this model now as an illustration about what I was saying about uh, how the critical exponents show up in the correlation functions on the cylinder, right? So let's talk about a particularly easy example is to uh, understand what happens to magnetic operators on the cylinder. So now I'm going to have my cylinder. Remember here it was. It had circumference big L. And I'm going to now assume it's very, very long but finite. Length little L, much bigger than small l, small l much, much bigger than little big l, which doesn't make sense, but it is. Okay, so we have this model on the cylinder now, and I'm now going to introduce a couple of magnetic operators here, m and minus m. Okay, so what do these magnetic operators do? Well, we know that in the plane, when we went around in the plane, that the, the, the field theta changed by an amount 2 pi m. This was this thing here. So going around in the plane, it changes by 2 pi m. So when we map this plane to the cylinder here, it means that the field Theta, as we go, 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 go around here, suffers 
a change delta theta which is which is 2 pi m so so that means that as a function of this is u and this is v on on the cylinder that i can write theta of u and v as equal to 2 pi over l times m times v plus something that I call theta tilde of u and v, which is going to have periodic boundary conditions under, so this is going to be periodic under v goes to v plus l. So this term, which is increasing linearly in v, is going to change from 0 to 2 pi m as v goes from 0 to l, OK? So this, is going to, this term here is going to take into account the discontinuity of, of, of theta as I go around here. And the rest is then going to be periodic, OK? So now I would like to compute the energy over kt of this configuration. It's g over 4 pi, the integral of the gradient of, of theta squared, right, which is the gradient. Well, first of all, I'm going to take the derivative with respect to v, so it's 2 pi over m plus the derivative with respect to v of theta tilde squared, plus the derivative in the u direction of theta tilde squared, OK, du dv. That's the energy, OK? And now I can expand out this square, and I get g g over 4 pi times 2 pi m over l squared times the area of the cylinder, which is big L times little l. OK, that's this term squared. And then there's a cross term. But the cross term is proportional to dv of, 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 of theta tilde. So it's a total derivative. And because theta tilde is periodic in v, it integrates up to 0. So the cross term is 0. And then what I've got left is what I would have if the elect if the Magnetic operators were not there. So it's just integral of grad of theta tilde squared d2r. So this isn't going to affect the correlation function. What I want to do is to work out the change in the energy from what was there from introducing the 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 magnetic operators, and it's this thing here. So the partition function so the partition function with the operators present divided by the usual one, which is the correlation function, is is going to go like e to the minus this this quantity here, which if I have it right is e to the minus two pi two pi over l times x tilde of m, where x tilde of m is this formula that I gave here m squared g over 2. OK. So, and there's, a, there's an L here. 
Okay, so what we see is that the two-point correlation function of these magnetic operators decays exponentially along the cylinder, e to the minus small l, with an inverse correlation length, which is, which is, which is this, which is just an example of what I showed you last time. In general, if you have a two-point function of a scaling field with scaling dimension x, then the two-point function along the cylinder decays in this way, e to the minus 2 pi over big L, x times the distance along the cylinder. So that's just, just an example which, which shows how that calculation works. Now, there is one thing that I told you last time was that I did general, we could think of this quantity here as being the energy um, of the nth excited state of the Hamiltonian, which is taking us along the cylinder here. So this is going like e to the minus e n minus e zero times L. So E n minus E zero is two pi x over L. But I also told you last time that there was also a formula for what the ground state energy is also. So I told you last time, and I didn't justify it, that, that in fact, E zero is minus pi C over six L, where C is a number that I've yet to introduce, but I want to show you for the Gaussian model where this formula comes from. So the formula that I want is that if I just look at the partition function, if this is big L and this is small L, that the partition function itself, without looking at any correlation functions, is going to go like e to the pi c uh, little l over big L. Okay, so how can I see this in the Gaussian model? So how does this work for the Gaussian model? And there's a six there. In particular, where does this six come from? You know, six, where does six come from? So there's a nice way of, there's, a, there's all kinds of, of different ways of obtaining this, this result. But I'm going to show you in the last 15 minutes. I think I have 10 minutes according to this. I don't believe that. I've got 15. Anyway. I'm going to show you a nice way of doing this. And, th and this is to think about this partition function on the cylinder in a different way. I'm going to think of it like this is space. And this is imaginary time. So the partition function is is going to be the trace of e to the minus integral from zero up to l of, of g over four pi times the integral from zero up to l dv times the integral from zero up to small l du times times grad times times d d five by d v squared plus d five by d u squared d u d v. Okay. So now I'm going to think of L as corresponding to inverse temperature beta. And I'm going to think of this as being the action of my 
theory, the Euclidean action. So it's an action of a theory whose Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian which takes me this way, this Hamiltonian is going to be proportional to the Hamiltonian for a free scalar field, which is pi squared plus graph d u phi squared d u. So this, where pi is the canonical conjugate to phi. So this is just the Hamiltonian for a free scalar field. And a free scalar field just corresponds to a bunch of bosons. All right? So this is a theory of bosons at temperature one over beta, which is one over L. And this partition function, Z, is nothing but the trace of e to the minus L, where, where L is beta times the Hamiltonian. And the thing that I'm interested in is to, is to write this e to the minus L times some free energy. And, and I'm interested that the log of the partition function is going to be the free energy. This is going to be essentially the free energy for a gas of bosons a gas of relativistic boat massless bosons. Okay, so this is a problem which I would have hoped that you've all done in a basic course in statistical mechanics where you do fermions and you do bosons. This is free bosons, free quantum bosons. So the free energy, or beta times the free energy, L times the free energy, let me call it beta, which is L, times the free energy, is equal to plus L times the integral decay over 2 pi times the logarithm of 1 minus e to the minus beta times omega k, where this is the dispersion relation, omega k. These are, these are massless bosons, so they have... They're like photons, they have a dispersion relation that. So this is precisely the formula which when you do black body radiation, this is black body radiation. If, if this was D3K, this would be black body radiation. Okay, that so you all study, I hope, in a basic course in TAPMAC. Okay, so here's our formula. We just have to actually work it out, okay? So the way that you actually do this is to expand out the logarithm. So it's minus L integral dk over 2 pi sum n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n e to the minus beta times the modulus of k. And there's an n here, okay? And now we can do the um, the integral dk. So this is minus l times one over two pi times the sum over n from one to infinity, one over n squared and there's a 1 over beta, and there's a factor of 2 also because we, we have to integrate over minus k and plus k because the bosons can go to the left or the right. Okay, so anybody know what this is? Pi squared over, this is pi squared over 6. It's the theta function of 2. So yeah, you remember that when you do black body radiation in three dimensions, you get the zeta function of four. So here you get the, or three, or four. Anyway, here you get the zeta function of two, which is pi squared 
over six. So you put all these things together and you find that the logarithm of the partition function now, which is the free energy, which is minus the free energy, goes like pi times L over six, L which was beta, okay, and with C equals one. So it's the right formula, but it just so happens that for this particular conformal field theory, very important, C equals one. I haven't defined C yet, so it's one. I will define C next time, I guess. Okay, so um, so this is a, this is a very simple way of obtaining this result here, and it gives you an example of how important it is in this subject to be continually changing your perspective. We can either think of this as some statistical mechanics model in two dimensions, are you just a classical model, or we can think of it as a quantum model defined on a circle with time going this way. That's one way to, to think about it in terms of these energy eigenstates here. Or we can think of it as a quantum model where this is space, this is time, and we're at finite temperature. So there's a great advantage in continually switching your points of view here. So um, I have one minute left, uh, but I think uh, I've said all I wanted to do for today. So are there any... I've got five minutes, but... I think uh, I'll be starting on a brand new thing to do with the stress tensor and the ward identities, and I can't start on, on, on that now, so I'll invite questions. Um, okay, so I was using the fact um, that um, that when you compute, I think this answers you know, your question. When you compute the partition function in quantum statistical mechanics, you can write this as the path integral in imaginary time and it's periodic in imaginary time. This is thermo sorry, I didn't get your question. Oh, the vortices. Okay. So 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 the vortices um, <laughs> Remember that the, the the scaling dimension of a of a vortex was was proportional to g, right? Was proportional to g, so it was proportional to the temperature. Okay. So what I haven't told you is that the renormalization group eigenvalue corresponding to adding that to the to, to that the action is 2 minus x cubed. Uh, something went wrong here. Oh, yeah, it was m squared. Where did it go? Just a minute, I'll have to check mine. So the point is that the Vortices have too much energy um, at low temperatures, so they they are unlikely to form. But that's not the what I was trying to say here. Just a moment. Oh, G was proportional to one over the temperature. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so at low temperatures, the scaling dimension of the vortices is very, very large, and, th and that means the renormalization group eigenvalue is irrelevant. And therefore, they don't affect, they don't change the critical behavior, which is the Gaussian one. So the way that the costellate stylus transition happens is that the x of the smallest, this is, this is xm, 
the x of the smallest possible vortex, which corresponds to xm, x1, goes through, goes through 2. And at that t t temperature, the vortices become relevant, and that's the costless Dallas transition. Did that answer your question? No, no. Okay. If you have a a finite system, then it will have a a a, a finite energy. But one way to, to basically understand it is that I looked at a single vortex and I found that the partition that it basically had an energy that went like logarithm of L over A, okay, for a, 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 a single vortex. Now, if you have two vortices, if you have a vortex and an anti-vortex here, a distance r apart, then the energy at large distances they they cancel each other out, so the energy is then finite. But they have the same short distance distance singularity here. So now the energy goes like two logarithm r over a. So e to the minus this decays as a power of r. So the vortex, anti-vortex correlation function decays with, with, with an exponent 2xm, which is what I said. So this way of estimating the energy for a, for a single vortex was just a quick way of getting at the scaling dimension without actually doing the calculation of having a vortex and a vortex pair, but it gives you, gives you a right answer. Any other questions?